Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum and welcome to this special broadcast titled Gaza, a Muslim response. Now, the situation in Gaza specifically and Palestine in general has gripped the attention of Muslims as well as non-Muslim, peace-loving and justice-seeking people around the globe. The current focus, understandably, is on the specifics of uh, the Israeli bombardment on uh, Gaza. But there are issues that become talking points every time we see an escalation in uh, oppression against Palestinians, be it in Gaza, be it at Masjid al-Aqsa or in other parts of uh, Palestine. And it is some of those issues that uh, we wish to unpack on this uh, very special broadcast today, inshallah. Our guest for the discussion, we have uh, Brother Ismail Adam Patel from Friends of Al-Aqsa in the UK. We have Maulana Ibrahim Bam, the Secretary General of Jamiat Ulama South Africa. And we have Maulana Ibrahim Musa of the Palestine Information Network. Uh, Ismail, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome. Assalamu and assalamu alaikum to all the listeners as well. Maulana Ibrahim Bam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah and assalamu alaikum to all the listeners. And uh, Maulana Ibrahim Musa, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu fiqh maulana. All right, so Ismail, if I, can, if I can start with you, the context of the conflict, you know, we see in many mainstream interviews, if anyone who is sympathetic with the Palestinian cause or shows solidarity uh, with the Palestinian issue, uh, the, the opening question would be about recent happenings. And, and there's a broader context to that. Perhaps we, we can ask you to, to outline that for us uh, and also to, to unpack for us who has the legitimate claim as, as the original uh, occupants uh, of, uh, of the land. Recently, we see many interviews of the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu being circulated where he says, well, uh, the, the Jewish people have original claim on this land from the time of King David. Uh, what, what, uh, what is the response to that? Uh, well, first, let me sort of slightly diverge because I think it's very important that we Muslims understand that the position we're in, uh, we have had our pious predecessors, and particularly the life of the Prophet is reflected in what is happening. So we should dig into that, try and understand the present context. So to remember that as a background and come back to your question, of course, uh, the Palestinians, as we know, uh, have been suffering for the past 75 years. In fact, in 1947-48, 70 70% of Palestinians were made refugees, 531 Palestinian villages were ethnically cleansed, and today they constitute 7 million Palestinian refugees. Uh, so the issue did not start on the 7th of October. The Palestinians have been suffering for over 75 years. Gaza itself was double the size that we see today. In fact, the cities of Ashkelon, Ashdod, were part of Gaza, and pe people in Gaza now see their homes being occupied by uh, people from Europe, the Jewish immigrants from Europe, and have taken off their property. So you can see the hurt that they feel on a daily basis, which they see right across the fence. So if you like, that is the very short context of the present problem, but you also touched on the wider issue of mm. legitimacy of land. Now, if we were to go back in history and every people who have occupied a particular land at a certain period in history claims that land to be theirs, we would have a total mayhem in the world. So let me give you an example. Yes, we accept that during Daud al-Islam and Suleiman al-Islam, uh, there were the Banu Israel and Daud al-Islam was the king, as the Quran very specifically says, and the prophet of uh, the region of Baytul Maqdis, and so Suleiman al-Islam. But if we use that pretext, then for Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us everywhere, every piece of land belongs to Allah. So Muslims, can Muslims claim the whole world belongs to them? That's the first thing. But historically, let's look at specific places, in particularly Britain. I mean, Britain was once occupied by the Romans. You know, it was a Roman territory. Caesar came to Britain uh, and it became part of the Roman Empire. Today, can we say that Italians can come to Britain and say, look, you know, or Caesar occupied it and therefore Britain belongs to the Romans, uh, to the Italians. We wouldn't do that. You know, similarly, Muslims ruled uh, Andalusia, Spain for 500 years. Do we go to Spain today and say, look, because Muslims ruled it, therefore we want to take it over and this belongs to Muslims. Similarly, the Aborigines in Australia or the indigenous people in Americas. 
So you can see the, the bankruptcy of this argument uh, and the rationale. And hence, on both counts, on one, the historical count of reclaiming something because thousands of years ago they lived there for almost 30, they were only ruled it for something like 98 years, only 98 years, thousands of years ago. You can't claim legitimacy on that. And you cannot also claim that the problems with the Palestinians for the Israelis started on the 7th of October. It goes back at least 75 years in which the Palestinians have been subjugated, occupied, uh, discriminated against, and hence you have an apartheid policy in Israel. Well, Bam, would you like to add to that uh, point about context and history? Well, there, there is no doubt, and I, I, I agree with um, Ismail to say that uh, uh, if you start looking at it from that particular perspective, uh, then there would be mayhem. And in al arda lillah yuri thuhamay yashahu min ibadi. Allah Ta'ala in the Holy Quran, in the ninth Jews says, the earth belongs to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will put in charge of the earth and land whomsoever he pleases. So your person says, uh, we have been authorized by Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take over your land. Uh, and of course, another perspective that comes in is that on what basis do you tell another person that my religious scripture is a title deed over the land that you have possessed for the past 50, 100 years? I mean, can you imagine someone coming to another person and saying on the scripture of what um, my holy book says, that is a title deed over the land that you have. So I think that is true. Then another point, if you take it at recent history, uh, and I think Muhammad Haikal has made mention with regard to it, that the original founding principle of Theodor Herzl was uh, a land without people for people without a land. And he, he relates this incident of the rabbis of Vienna going over uh, to go and see what he was talking about. And they sent uh, a very famous telegram back uh, to the congregation uh, to, to disprove that particular slogan to say a land without people for people without a land by saying the bride is beautiful, but she's married to someone else. What are you mm -hmm. talking that there are no people there on that land? That land is occupied by people who are indigenous to the land. So, yes, even from that recent history perspective, uh, the founding slogans uh, were misinformed. Well, Ibrahim Musa, you, you can add to that if you wish, but if I can also just broaden the question and the background to the, to the, to the present situation. We know, and we are reminded uh, quite rightly so, that you can't only look at it from October 7th. You've got to look at it uh, you know, in the, from the prism of 70 or 80 years uh, of occupation, of oppression, of treating uh, Palestinians like uh, like animals. Uh, do, do, can you elaborate on that for us? Absolutely, Mulana. And I think what uh, Ismail Bay had mentioned earlier uh, in terms of the, the context, particularly of Gaza. So if we were now to you know move this closer to recent events, we've emphasized the point, everybody has emphasized the point that one cannot have a memory of seven or 10 days or 14 days or 16 days, whatever it is now, versus uh, a memory of 75 years or 100 years, which is the historical roots of this injustice. But if we were to bring it to circumstances closer to, to the present, which is obviously a continuation of this 75-year uh, story or this 100-year story, we first of all look at the fact that the majority of people in the Gaza Strip are refugees. And it's impossible to understand the story of Gaza without knowing those 247 ethnically cleansed villages, you know, in these areas that were attacked by the fighters on October the 7th, that uh, all of that, as Ismail Bay has mentioned, were villages that were ethnically cleansed by Zionist forces in 1948. And the refugees from those areas then become the predominant population in, in the Gaza Strip. And then on the back of that, uh, we obviously would look at the recurrent Israeli wars uh, starting in 2008 uh, on the Gaza Strip. We've got 2012, we've got 2014, we've got 2021, we've got 2022. Prior to that, you've got the denial of the democratic choice of the Palestinian people when they had elected Hamas to be their, their, their leaders, uh, the imposition of the siege on the Gaza Strip, uh, that dire warning that was put out by the United uh, United Nations 
that Gaza would become unlivable by the year 2020. Uh, that passed the idea of Dove Weiss class, that the idea is to put the Palestinians on a diet and not, but not make them die of, of hunger, calculating very inhumanely the calories that Palestinians would uh, you know, be able to subsist on in the Gaza Strip. And more recently, we've, we've got obviously the most right-wing Israeli government coming into power. Uh, this effectively was dubbed the new Nakba government, a government uh, that openly called for a new Nakba. Uh, the antics of the likes of uh, Bezalet Smotrich and uh, Itamar ben Gavir, the pogroms that we had in Gaza, very devastating scenes over successive Ramadans in Masjid al-Aqsa, remind ourselves of Qadar Adnan, how he died in Isra Israeli captivity. And while he was uh, in prison, uh, he was obviously suppressed, denied his essential human rights. And after that, uh, Qadar Adnan's body till this day is denied to be returned to his, to his family. So all of this, uh, you know, is something that the Palestinian people, the Palestinian resistance have been looking at for a long period of time and not always have they been able to respond uh, but obviously now the, this is the time that they feel uh, you know has created the necessity to respond to this deluge of crimes and also a means to extract some accountability for 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 the for, for the crimes that have been committed particularly uh, accelerated since the uh, you know ascension of this latest right wing israeli government so by coming to you, right, um, we, we constantly hear this, especially from Western leaders, that Israel has the right to defend itself. Uh, and those pushing this line, they make uh, they make some arguments. They say that this has been the worst, what they label terror attack since 9-11. It's been the worst attack uh, on Israel since um, 67. They are constantly likening uh, the Palestinian resistance to, uh, to, uh, to ISIS, saying, the only way to 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 wipe out uh, such a resistance is is like how ISIS was wiped out. There has to be, unfortunately, hefty and heavy civilian casualties. There, there's no other way uh, around that. Uh, if you're dealing uh, with people who are going to use um, the civilians in Gaza as as human shields, uh, use hostages as as human shields, uh, there's no other way around this uh, but to inflict heavy civilian casualties in order to be able to eliminate the threat and to defend uh, Israel? Well, now you've covered so many uh, issues there that, that are important to sort of try and expand. Let me take uh, the first one. Uh, has Israel got a right to defend itself? In a way, this when you ask a wrong question, you get a wrong answer. Uh, what we have known right from the beginning, that Israel is an occupying power, is a colonialist entity that has been forever since 1947-48, expanding more and more land, uh, taking over more Palestinian land and getting rid of the Palestinians from that territory. So the very idea of defense is an oxymoron, that Israel is an aggressor. It's, an, it's, it's always been on offensive, it never has been in defense. So that, that is very misleading. And I think that's very important for us to understand that when Israel and its supporters say, has Israel got the right to defend itself, what they're basically saying, has Israel right to continue with its colonization? So that's the difference. And I think we have to understand that Israel is not defending itself against anybody. Palestine has got no military. It has got no navy. It has no army. They're just individuals who are occupied or trying to resist occupation. So this also is extremely important to understand the disparity in power between the two sides. We're not talking about two states here. We're talking about an occupier Israel occupying a certain the Palestinian people and the people themselves resisting. So the idea of defense doesn't come into the equation at all. So to expand on that, on the second part you, you touched on, that then they've what they've done in their propaganda, in their narrative, is they've reduced the whole of the Palestinian society into Hamas, and then Hamas equals ISIS, ISIS Al-Qaeda, because then that fits into the narrative of war on terror. It fits into the narrative of Muslims being aggressive, and it fits into this Western-centric racist ideology that anybody who's a Muslim who speaks up for justice must be annihilated. And therefore, it allows this dehumanization that is taking place, allows them to continue 
undermining the Palestinians and robbing them of the basic human rights. And here I really want to contrast this, that we yeah. have to re- now go back to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet of Allah himself was before the torture and before the expulsion took place uh, for him to leave the city of Makkah was the dehumanization of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all the Muslims. Now he was called a liar, he was called a sorcerer, he was called a magician. Uh, and then all the Sahabas were then undermined in the same principles and concept that what they were bringing was corruption in the city. And then violence was made possible upon them. And then they had to migrate. The very same principles today, of course, in a different format, much more severe, more globally, getting together with the powers of the time to be, are dehumanizing the Palestinians by using languages like they have a right to, def- does Israel have a right to defend itself? By using languages of reducing the Palestinians to terrorist entities that the West thinks are terrorist and, and try and then justify the violence against them. So this is a dehumanization process and this is very dangerous. Of course, we also, the language that's also been used attached to this uh, is referring to Palestinians as cockroaches, referring to them as animals, as bloodthirsty. Uh, these are terms that are parallel to towards when we saw in Rwanda against the genocide against the Tutsis. You know, the same principles were used. So that's why a lot of scholars, and particularly those who study genocide, are talking, are concerned that what we are seeing here is the unfolding of the genocide of the people of Gaza. Mona Baam and Mona Musa, do you want to add to this aspect of, of the whole argument that Israel has a right to defend itself? Yes, I, I, I would just like to say this, that uh, one of the, the, the that happens in a war is the war of words and the war of stories. So when you, you, you create a narrative, so you create such a narrative that brings empathy towards yourself and you cast the other side as subhuman. And as Ismail has explained, the same thing happened with um, Nazis, where they first called the Jews rats. So when they did do that, they, they created a, a situation of um, um, uh, justifying what, what was to come. And I think that is important for us to understand that uh, the same thing that they are doing with, with the Palestinians, that uh, they call them animals, etc. And another point is that uh, whether you look at the United Nations uh, Charter, which calls upon and uh, gives people the right to resistance. Uh, the Quran speaks about You have been permitted to fight because you have been oppressed in, to, as a resistance to the oppression. Although the Quran also says If the other side is inclined towards peace, as an instinctive reaction, you also be inclined to peace. But if hmm. peace is not just, then peace is not going to be sustainable. And if it's not going to be sustainable and there is going to be continued oppression, then it's a basic human right to be able to resist oppression. Well, Musa, if you want to add, and and, and together with that, I mean, a kind of uh, point that flows from there. We see, especially in in, in Western countries, there is a move uh, to legislate and to try and outlaw the slogan uh, from the river to the sea. Uh, claiming and alleging that this is calling for the destruction of uh, of, of Israel. Indeed, uh, just to to you know uh, elaborate on on the point, and there's a serious concern, as Ismail had mentioned, the question of of genocide. How uh, grave, while you know this allegation is on the one hand that that Palestinians are 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 seeking to wipe Israel off the map, and the resistance is seeking to wipe Israel off the map. How very real is the threat, as per a lot of the discussions that are happening behind closed doors at the moment to effectively wipe Gaza off the map and the very clear plans that have been articulated and the force that has been born born on Egypt, uh, for example, to accept over one million Palestinian refugees, the old Zionist idea of uh, you know solving the problem of the Palestinians of Gaza by push, pushing them into into Egypt and solving the problem of the Palestinians of the West Bank and pushing them into Jordan. So uh, you, you know why those those allegations are being you know projected on Palestinians, we see very real pressures to be able to push the Palestinians uh, and and you know complete the the Nakba uh, as many many Israelis or many Zionists, particularly this uh, latest, uh, brand of settler wants to complete the job that was not completed in 1948. 
Now, the, the other element that you mentioned, Paulana, which is the, the element of the draconian measures that have uh, come into play, many of these slogans, such as from the river to the sea, have been around for, for, a, very, for a very long period of time. And, uh, you know, n nobody seemed to be so incensed about them uh, until this particular moment in time when we obviously have, uh, you know, the, the, the mobilization of uh, a number of, of people within the Western world and supporters of Zionism to try and, you know, snuff out any expressions of, of Palestinian uh, solidarity. What we need to understand particularly about uh, that, that slogan is uh, that unlike what we have the UK Home Secretary at the moment saying that it, it is an expression of a violent desire to see Israel uh, erased from the world, uh, we have to again look at the historical context to when we talk about the, the area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, which is the entire area of, of historic Palestine. Uh, the Palestinian struggle started off with this idea to decolonize the land completely. Uh, but then obviously with uh, the 1967 war and thereafter the Oslo Accords, uh, you had the PLO uh, settling for only 22% of historical Palestine. And that always has been an issue of contention within Palestinian circles, the likes of Edward Said and so forth, describing it as a capitulation uh, that the, the PLO uh, had entered into and many it didn't sit well with many Palestinians, particularly with what happened after the signing of the Oslo Accords, which brought time for the Israelis, uh, and then expansion of the settlements in the West Bank, the increase of settler violence uh, against the Palestinians. And then many people uh, you know, started saying, this is untenable. Uh, we might have brought, brought into this paradigm, some of the Palestinians brought into the paradigm, but uh, is, is this uh, you know, feasible anymore uh, because of how fragmented these occupied territories have, have become, uh, become? And uh, the, you know, the, this has now become the mainstream discourse uh, where we have Human Rights Watch reports, Amnesty International reports, and even Bet Salem reports, uh, where they spoke about a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And that has got the world talking about the real nature of Israeli, uh, Israeli democracy and the many parallels between South Africa, apartheid South Africa and Israel. So at, at that, what, what we had seen here is the, the need to, to discuss, because the Israelis are now extending their sovereignty over all of historic Palestine, not just the occupied territories, we have to look at the issue in the Gaza, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, as well as occupied Palestine, uh, 1948, because it is one system that extends throughout this. And while we are talking about this entire system, we should not believe that the slogan calls for the destruction of the Jewish people or, you know, moving them off completely off the land. It's talking about destruct, uh, you know, removing the infrastructure of oppression. And once that is removed, uh, then the broader questions of citizenship and nationality can be uh, ironed out. Just to add on that, yeah, sure. Right. Just to add on that, from river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Uh, it's very simply that the oppression that is taking place between those river and the sea, everything should end. So, for example, uh, there's seven million Palestinian refugees uh, who who's, who have been denied the right to return to their homes, and therefore we need justice for them. As Nolana already mentioned, that there's injustices. What was created in 1947, 48, uh, uh, what is called Israel today. Uh, there's so many injustices against the indigenous people. We want to see justice there. Uh, and we will also want to see the end of occupation and what was occupied in 1967. Uh, and of course, the end of siege of Gaza. So everything between the river and the sea uh, has to be free, means we want justice between that uh, area. Because without justice, there cannot be peace. Well, Abam. One of the issues that has come to the fore and comes to the fore whenever the Palestinian issue is um, is being discussed, and especially when there's an escalation of, of violence, uh, is, is the issue of boycotting. What, what's the Islamic perspective to, to the whole concept of boycotting? Well, you see, the, the, the one important point is, let, let us look at the principle. Now, we know that BDS, boycott, divestment and sanctions, is a Palestinian-led movement by people who are protesting against uh, the injustice in in that part of the world. Now, the 
what actually and the methodology that is used what can companies to boycott and how to boycott is something that the people who are in the know would make decisions and methodologies from time to time we looking at the principle now from the seerah of our beloved nabi akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam we find a very famous example of the three companions who were boycotted socially boycotted by our beloved nabi akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam because at that time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had called upon the companions to join an expedition it was part and parcel of showing loyalty to the cause that each and every one was supposed to be part of that expedition three companions who were sincere companions who were part of the muslim ummah who were part of the muslim uh, community for some reason maybe for whatever reason they could not partake and when nabi akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam came back they came in front of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying that o oh, prophet of almighty allah we could have come and justified and given you excuses but we decided that you are the prophet of almighty allah you are guided by revelation you are guided by the knowledge of almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we cannot say anything that is untowards or that is false and we have come to apologize and we have come to say that uh, we have done a mistake and we have done something that we had every reason and we wanted to come but for some reason especially kabir malik radiyallahu ta'ala nabi akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam called upon the community to boycott them and of course that boycott went on for a long period of time until a time came when they found it extremely difficult allah ta'ala in the holy quran says daqat alayhim al despite the violence of the land you know the land became restricted upon them so what we learn from here the principle the principle of boycotting something for a sake of a greater cause is something established in our sharia and of course um, uh, ismail in particular might be able to expand more on the the success stories with regard to boycott i can only start off by saying that this is something that is well grounded uh, in the sirah and in islamic um, uh, uh, theology Yes, Ismail, Is- you know, h- how successful has it been? I mean, BDS has been around for a while. What, what do the stats tell us? What do the results tell us? Uh, let me go back to our own principle before I answer that, Maulana. We, o- of, of course, also know that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself right. was boycotted in uh, Medina, uh, sorry, in Mecca for three years. Uh, and then there's a very famous incident of Thumama radiallahu anhu. Uh, Thumama accepts Islam in the, I think, fourth year of Hijrah. Uh, and then he he was of course not part of Quraysh. He comes from Yamama. He goes to Medina, accepts Islam, and then goes to Mecca to perform Umrah. Uh, people of Quraysh did not know that he had accepted Islam. And as he's performing his Umrah and reciting the Quran, they find out that of course he has converted, become a Muslim, and they stop him from carrying on his uh, performing of uh, of the Umrah. Uh, and he's very upset. He says, "How can you stop me uh, uh, remembering my Allah?" Uh, and he then takes an oath he says i will not sell you anything from yamama uh, and he was there were there were suppliers of grain at that time to the quraysh so he boycotts the quraysh and of course this boycott the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is aware of it doesn't stop him so we have here a practical incident in which thumama radiyallahu anhu boycotts the quraysh uh, and stops selling grain and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not stop him so we have also another example here the issue of boycott is absolutely incredible molana and one way to measure the success of boycott is to see what the israeli government has done the israeli government last year uh, allocated something like 31 million us dollars if i'm not mistaken 31 million us dollars to try and curb the boycott movement globally so you can see that you know they wouldn't be spending that kind of money if it wasn't making an impact so that's our first indicator that boycott is very very effective is non-violent is democratic and it's the principle upon which we can build on of course we've had many successes up and down that course so for example we started off a very big company g4s uh, that was employed by israeli security services to imprison palestinians uh, and to use their techniques to take the palestinians and use them uh, to to imprison them uh, the contract has not been renewed because of the global movement and g4s is one of the biggest global company We've also had Starbucks, who stopped its franchise within the West Bank. Uh, that was a big change. We have got other smaller companies, that, uh, of course, Ben and Jerry, uh, the ice cream company. Uh, this was again, uh, it's a boycott success. We've got many. Uh, the way we boycott in Britain is we're very, very targeted. 
we only use two companies and then we sorry three companies and say, check the check the label so let me start from the reverse order we, what we say that alhamdulillah when we go shopping we check the product how much calories it has whether it's halal or not we're only asking people to do a third thing check where it comes from if it's from israel don't buy it uh, in particularly i would sort of in South Africa, I would really urge the trade unions not to handle any products that comes from Israel at you know, seaports, at air freight positions. You know, shouldn't allow, should ask them and, and encourage them not to handle these products. But at local level, I think that's the, the checking of the label is extremely important. And the three products are Hewlett Packard. The reason we boycott them is because HP allows for the technology at checkpoints and for ID cards of the Palestinians. So they're intrinsic in trying to undermine the rights of the Palestinians. The second product is Puma, uh, which is a sportswear. And the reason we want to boycott Puma is because it sponsors the Israeli Football Association. And there's here a direct link of Puma trying to promote and endorse an apartheid racist colonial state. And thirdly and finally is Coca-Cola. For us, the reason we boycott Coke is because they have a plant in the West Bank which belongs to the Israelis, the license is to the Israelis, and because it's an occupied territory, they're legitimizing occupation. And of course, in order to produce coke, they're draining water from the Palestinians and depriving the Palestinians of the water. So these three products, and overall, check the label. And honestly, if we carry on uh, with our boycott, and of course, there's then the divestment and sanctions, that is different aspect, but this is boycott for individual levels that most of us are listening and our uh, audience here, uh, it's extremely important. And beyond and above that, I think it's just ethical, you know? Mm -hmm. Think about it. How can you consume goods from somebody who's stolen it from other people? You're, in, you're actually party to stolen property. And that moral ethics of a Muslim, of any just individual, should not allow you to buy anything that comes from Israel. Now, Mara Musa, the, the issue that comes up when we talk about boycotting is, is the issue of consistency. You know, at times you see these lists circulating on WhatsApp. There's a long list of brands and franchises and companies. Uh, and then when you start looking at it, many Muslims own, you know, franchises in terms of a, a particular chain. They may be working there. A particular bla brand of clothing is already quite popular with, with Muslims. Uh, is boycotting meant to be you know, consistent and comprehensive, or is it meant to be more targeted and, and strategic? I, I think the approach, again, uh, as our uh, brother Dr. Ismail Patel has mentioned there, would go a long way to explaining uh, perhaps the misconceptions that exist with, relate to, uh, with regard to boycotting. So the idea of these long lists is something that people could be aware of and could dictate ethical choices. But at the same time, we need to realize that there would be ethical boycotts and something that a person could do on a very individual scale. And there would be strategic boycotts. And people need to understand the purpose of strategic boycotts uh, in not only you know, creating um, an unfavorable economic climate for those companies and the support for the occupation, but also creating a wider climate to be able to challenge the occupation and how to build on what uh, Maulana Bam and, and Brother is uh, Ismail had, had mentioned here. Uh, again, the principles that underpin, because a lot of uh, the naysaying, if I may say, the naysaying that comes towards boycotting uh, is couched, if I may say again, in spiritual language. And we would use spiritual arguments to be able to justify apathy, particularly when it comes, comes to boycott. So, for example, one of the reasons why I would see it very critical to boycott is the demands of, of brotherhood, that uh, the hadith where whoever relieves the hardship of a believer in this world, Allah will relieve his hardship on the day of judgment. And likewise, the, the, uh, the, the consequence of, uh, consequences of not assisting or betraying a person who is going through injustice. Likewise, not being a partner in oppression. Help each other in righteousness and piety. Do not uh, be party in sin and oppression. And there's, uh, you know, this important uh, principle that has also been put forward by Imam al-Nawawi, where he says that uh, the Muslims are unanimously agree that it is permissible to interact with non-Muslims in trade so long as the object of the transaction is not impermissible. But it is not permissible, and he says there's ijma' on this, there's consensus on this, 
it is not permissible for a Muslim to sell weapons or tools of war to those who are waging war against the Muslims. So it's it's quite clear the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, identified that the struggle when he said the struggle against the mushrikeen, do it with your lives, your tongues, as well as your wealth. So there's that element as well uh, to the struggle, and I I, I think. Back to what, what you, uh, you know, fundamentally asked here, Murana, is mm. that uh, the argument many a time has been, why are you boycotting this and you are not boycotting this? If you're doing this, why are you not doing this? And uh, th this, you know, falls into a kind of perfectionist fallacy, which I would argue, again, is a trick of shaitan to prevent us from you know uh, engaging in any good deed so the idea is that if one cannot fully solve the problem do not solve the problem at all uh, and that's just a a, a very uh, simple excuse for inaction but even in the south african context um I, I would say strategically just as we've learned from the example of the uk not to bombard people with long lists but go to products where there is a very clear complicity in oppression based on factual evidence well, Bam, if, if I can just bring the South African situation um, into focus and get your thoughts on it, right? So we see currently in South Africa, uh, certain halal certifiers are being targeted. That Why do you uh, certify this franchise or why do you certify this product? There's an, you know, a connection there with, with Israel. Um, if you look at a certain brand of, of clothing uh, in winter months, especially when it comes to, to the heavy jackets, if you look around in the masjid, almost half, if not more, of the brothers in the masjid are wearing that particular brand. So it becomes quite simplistic in, in, in the way people debate these things. It's like, you know, if you continue to wear that brand, you continue to eat at that franchise, you continue to certify, that means you don't, you don't care for the Palestinians. It means that you're not taking um, the Palestinian issue uh, all that seriously. That's apart from the fact that some may be employed there, some may be having long-standing business relationships. That on one hand, on the other hand, like what Dr. Ismail and, and Musa have explained, about the ethical responsibility, how, how do we balance the two at, at a social level, at the community level? Well, there, there is no doubt, as Morana Ibrahim Musa had said, that uh, there is permissibility with regard to trading with people of different faiths. And that is well established in our Sharia, in our theology, in our fiqh. Uh, as a Sheikh al Hadith, as a Mona Zakaria Sabrahmatullah has made mention that there are few things that uh, it is permitted to do across the faith spectrum. And one of them is, 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 trade. He also says about one, one aspect in particular, he says that uh, uh, the Quran tells us, Ya you are amanu awfu bi O believers, uh, fulfill your commitments. And he says that there is no difference in fulfilling your commitments with people of your own faith or across the faith spectrum. So the uh, first thing we have to you know, bear in mind is that the permissibility. Now, how do you make the difference between uh, a company that is permitted to, to deal with on the basis of theology, on the basis of fiqh, or on a call made from uh, a particular authority that stay away from this particular company because we are boycotting it uh, for strategic reasons. And I think maybe the way to deal with it is that, uh, see, bear in mind that the uh, fiqh point of view, it is permissible. But if there is a call for strategic reasons from a particular uh, authority, whether that authority, you might completely agree with it or you don't agree with it. Or, for example, as it has been said, that many times there isn't consistency in, in, in boy boycotting. You look at where you can make the most, uh, uh, you know, strategically, you can make the greatest impact. Then we go by that particular call. So we don't say that it is not permitted to, to deal with people of other faiths uh, in terms of business, of course, which is permissible. But you go by the authority, uh, which has... Uh, some form of author authority on a matter, and you go by that particular call. Dr. Ismail, you know, from boycotting to, to protest, this is another, you know, discussion point. We, we've seen the world over, including in, in your country, the UK, hundreds of thousands of people come out onto the streets and, 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 and protest against what's happening in, in, in Gaza and, and condemn uh, the Israeli regime for its, uh, for its brutality. There are those then from within our own community that are somewhat skeptical. They say, well, Every time we go, we march in big numbers, hundreds of thousands. In South Africa, we've seen the, the major, two of the major political parties, the ANC and the EFF, lead their own marches uh, in solidarity with the Palestinians. Uh, but the skeptics amongst us ask the question, what difference does it make? Every time round we'll have these marches, it doesn't ease the plight of the Palestinians. It's not 
putting pressure from their perspective on the on the Israeli regime? Well, th thank you for a very important question, really, as particularly in this time. Uh, first thing about protest is, of course, it shows uh, the world is united against a particular aspect. And here we see that the majority of the globe uh, are united for the Palestinian cause and for the freedom of the Palestinians. And very importantly, right at the outset, what I want to say is think about the people in Gaza. They have no access to the outside world information. They don't know what is happening. The little glimpses they have is maybe a, an image of showing a demonstration in South Africa, in London, in New York, in Paris, where people are marching in their support. Just think for 30 seconds what joy or what relief it would give the person who is under besiege and under bombardment from Israel in Gaza when they see that, to think that they're not alone. That gives them hope. That hope, I think, is sufficient reason for people to do what to protest. So that's the first thing I would like to outline. But also, protests have significance. Let's take the example of the war on terror or when Britain and the USA allied against the bombing of Iraq. One million people marched. We did not stop the bombing of Iraq. Absolutely right. But all the leadership that were engaged in that have now become known as war criminals. They cannot have a platform on public arena. They're walking in the shadows and in the sights. So that is the impact of boycotting. And of course, what we do is we expose the political elites and the powers to be. So today, America and Europe wants us to think that Israel is on the right. We, we have a right to ignore international law. We have a right. Israel has a right to do whatever it can. But the public is saying no. In America, there was a poll just today that 66% of Americans think there should be an immediate ceasefire and Israel is in the wrong. In Britain, we have a similar poll in which majority of the British public are in sympathy with the Palestinians and they are coming out on the streets. So this is also uh, to allow the truth to speak for itself through protests. Because what protests are doing is saying that, no, we do not accept the leadership of our countries, our respective uh, countries. And we are in sympathy with the people in Palestine. So it does bring about a change. But also on, on the whole aspect of those individuals who say that uh, protest is not part of Islamic ethos or principles, or it's not grounded in our history. Well, we should look of the Muslims in Mecca itself. They were protesting every day when Bilal radiallahu anhu refuses uh, to accept uh, his masters, his slave masters as a, as a slave, to, to renounce uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to renounce la ilaha illallah. That is a protest. But also there's protest by Abdullah ibn Masud radiallahu anhu. Now he accepts Islam when there's only about 20 Muslims. And he goes, uh, he, he wants to proclaim his faith and he goes to the Kaaba and performs Surah Rahman loudly. There's only 20 Muslims. He's a young teenager. And when the Quraysh hear the words, when his protest, if you like, uh, they pounce on him and they attack him. And the other Sahabas have to protect him. So this idea of protest not being part of Islamic principles, yes, the word protest was not used, but what they were doing, the Sahabas, right, and particularly the Meccan period, where they were protesting against the elites, the Quraysh of the time. And that is also what we are doing. And time will tell, uh, and we will bring about a change because it's the movement that brings about a change. In particularly, the South Africans must be very conscious that if you look at the South African collapse of the apartheid system, it wasn't because the world powers to be, like the Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher in Britain or Ronald Reagan in America, uh, somehow become sympathetic to the black cause and against apartheid. It was the European people and the American people who forced the elites of the, of the countries to change their mind. And only after that was they played a part in bringing down apartheid in South Africa. All right, I'm just waiting for uh, my Brian Baum to join us. I think uh, we've just uh, lost him momentarily. I hopefully he'll be able to reconnect. Uh, there is a particular question that I wanted to pose to him about the issue of uh, of, of of protesting. Uh, well, Musa, in the meanwhile, there, there is also from within the Muslim community a call to to you know uh, give more focus to spirituality rather than uh, activism, if I can use those those terms very generically. Uh, and and the, 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 those making the call say, you know, help will come from Allah. So turn to Allah rather than doing things that will, will try to solicit help from uh, from humans or from 
uh, from governments or from activists? Again, that um, probably falls within this this idea, as I mentioned earlier, um, and we're not going to prejudge anybody's intentions in, 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 in these kind of situations, but the idea uh, that, you know, we sometimes couch um, the, the the question of, of our responsibility or we shield responsibility by, by uh, you know, spiritual arguments. What, uh, what we need to understand, and I think historical precedent is very important here. Uh, if we were to look at the examples of uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi of the past, we always associate with uh, the uh, important feats that he achieved for the Ummah relating to the liberation of Al Aqsa. If we look at his predecessor, Nuruddin Zanki, etc., uh, these were people who were extremely grounded in spirituality. Uh, you know, for, just to illustrate, Nuruddin Zanki, rahimahullah, would you know, treasure the du'as of the uh, the widows and the orphans uh, so much that he would even give it, give them a stipend. And he would say to his army that even though you have weapons, these weapons sometimes, you know, would fire and sometimes they would misfire. But the arrows of the prayers, the arrows of the du'as of the oppressed um, and the widows and the children, those are arrows that never, ever miss their target. He was the one who initiated the practice of, you know, uh, firing a cannon in Damascus to get people up for Salat al-Tahajjud. Uh, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah himself, a lover of hadith, a lover of Quran, a person who set up so many madaris, and a person himself who, it is said, despite being on the battlefield, never, ever missed uh, Salah in congregation. So uh, that is an essential part of, of the struggle, uh, but uh, at, at the same time, uh, it, it, it still goes back to that earlier uh, argument uh, that, that I've made, where people would say this needs to come first versus that. If you are not doing this, this cannot, cannot be done. Uh, and uh, the, this is obviously an, an argument that would get uh, nobody in, in any direction of progress would not be made. Uh, by you, you know saying that X needs to be uh, to be achieved before Y needs to be achieved, uh, and, and uh, we then again take precedent from those examples of the past that there needs to be a holistic struggle. Um, there needs to be together with the spiritual struggle, all the other elements of struggle infused with spirituality. So the uh, you know importance of the importance of of, of a diplomatic. Uh, uh, diplomatic skills, the importance of media advocacy, uh, where, where the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, takes Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu an and uh, Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu an, and you know, tells them to defend the cause with their poetry. That was the media of the time, and the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam even making dua, oh Allah, assist them with Ruhul Qudus, assist them with Jibrail alaihi salam. So there is a media element. Uh, there's a diplomatic element, uh, there's the element of building up uh, one's uh, military capacity in, a, a, as we see in the time of the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all of these, uh, you know, show that there's a need for a holistic struggle when they all come together, infused with that spirituality and not uh, ignoring that sp spirituality, that translates itself into uh, a, a great movement that can take people closer to freedom. Mahabam, we lost you when we were talking about protest marches. And the question I wanted to ask you is that um, there are those who say that, okay, a protest march in itself uh, is not the issue. We understand the impact it can have. But uh, protest marches coordinated and organized by political parties will have uh, music. They will have many things which is un-Islamic. And even those organized at times by Muslims have intermingling, etc. Uh, how can Muslims then be involved there? You're trying to draw the, 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 the help of Allah and you can't do that by associating with activity in which uh, the laws of Allah contravene. Well, firstly, let me start off by saying that um, uh, the aspect of protest itself, our ulama have spoken about it. I've spoken and we've seen the statement of Sheikh Hulhin Rahmatullahi who said that uh, in previous time that people used to fight with weapons and sometimes if you don't have the weapons, you express your 
protests and your anger in various ways with regard to what is happening. Now, the ulama, for example, you find in Pakistan, I, I've been part of Pakistan, I've seen our ulama taking part in different types of protests, whether it be at the time of the Qadiani issue, there used to be widespread uh, type of protests on the road uh, saying that Qadianis are not part of, of uh, Islam and uh, the legislation must um, support what is essentially uh, agreed upon by all the ulama. So Muslims were protesting on that particular matter. We have the call from Mufti Taqi Usmani to express your protest over what is happening. You have other people saying, express your anger. Now, many a times when people do something, you must keep in mind, you're going in there with an intention. You can be responsible for each and every person who is out there. The basic thing is permissibility. The basic thing is you are going to express and protest on a particular matter. Do you take into account each and everything that is there? Do you take into account each and every person who come into a masjid? What is his background? Is he doing right? Is he not doing right? So my, my point is that in this particular protest, we go in because generally our ulama have said that there is a need to demonstrate and show your anger. You're not responsible for each and everyone who is there. You go in with the right intention. Just as you go for different reasons, you might be going to, to fly from here for Umrah. But in during the course of the Umrah, during the course of your flight, we all know what actually happens. So I think the, the main reason we're going in there is with the intention to show our protest over what is happening. And the way with regard to the, the question is, uh, what difference does it make? We, it's our responsibility to make effort. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's responsibility to change. We always say, Inna kala You cannot make, give hidayah to whomsoever you wish. Allah will give hidayah to whomsoever he wishes. But are you obliged to make an effort with regard to the hidayah of people? Obviously, yes. So we make the effort and we leave it in the hands of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala results in our uh, effort. I mean, at the moment, all our efforts together is not resulting in what we are trying to achieve. Doesn't mean that we in any way we uh, forsake those efforts. You know, I mean, the incident of the bird in the time of the fire of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, taking a little bit of water and throwing it and said, well, that is my particular type of effort in uh, extinguishing the fire that has been created for Khalilullah. This is our effort. The efforts are different. Some of the, uh, you know, just to say, the people who are working on social media to try and change a narrative, uh, they are doing a great service. We can't go and undermine their sacrifices they are doing something, let us cooperate with one another. Just to say that, I mean, we all know that there are attempts on social media and the, by the people who control the social media to undermine and to diminish pro-Palestinians' uh, post. So if it was not having an impact, why are they diminishing it? Why are they discarding it? Why are they trying to bring it down? So I think it's important for us that uh, this is not the time for us to criticize one another. Let us... Um, uh, the holy hands of one another and try to the best of our ability to do things correctly, but not by undermining and criticizing and judging other people who are using their own means of showing their protest. Dr. Ismail, we, we have about two or three minutes left. I, I want to give you the opportunity to, to talk to us about the way forward as a Muslim ummah and, uh, you know, Palestinian activists between the, beyond the Muslim community. What's your assessment of what's likely to happen now? We know Israel is putting a lot of pressure for the people of Gaza to move from the north to the south. Uh, they, they're not complying in the main. Uh, many are saying what has happened in recent weeks could be a game changer. It could be a catalyst uh, for the liberation of the Palestinian people uh, going forward. Many are reminding us that we shouldn't be stuck in the moment. We should use the emotions of the moment to uh, to refine our long-term strategy when it comes to the, to the Palestinian issue. Uh, what, what are your concluding thoughts in this regard, the, the direction and, and the way forward? Well, I think what is happening on the ground, first and foremost, is Israel is trying to replay the 47, 48 ideology, what is called the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. They want to move the people of Gaza out from the north into the Sinai, uh, into Egypt, so they become refugees. And of course, then that means Israel can take over whatever's remaining of Gaza. Uh, so that's, the very, if you like, the strategy, and that would be a successful Zionist Israeli strategy if they, they manage that. But I think what is more important for us here, and I think what we, I would like to conclude on, is what role do we play? You know, of course, every one of us uh, is concerned about this, crying, raising our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
But most importantly, we should ask ourselves, what are we doing for Gaza? This is the time for action. Use and employ every means possible to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only ask us as individuals on the day of Qiyamah, what did you do? That mm. is the question we should try and answer. That if we are asked that, what will we reply to our creator? What did we do? And here we've touched a few aspects, practical aspects that we are allowed, we are capable and allowed to do in this, in this world at this present time. And boycotting was one of them, protesting was one of them. Uh, there was mention of social media, the employment of that in a positive way, uh, lobbying of, of politicians, campaigning against the mainstream media, against the biases that it's spewing out, uh, ex exhibiting our uh, concern and love for our brothers in Palestine by even it might mean flying a flag. These are bare minimum. And of course, this should all be tied in with dua and salah and getting off a tahajjud. It shouldn't be one versus the other. It should be all together. We are Islam is a comprehensive way of faith. We, we have to do everything. Uh, and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'd like to end on this. He is the greatest of the creator. And his dua was accepted more than any one of us here. Yet look at his life. Did he simply stay in Medina when the Mushrikeen got together, the Confederates of Arabia got together uh, and wanted to attack, attack Medina? No, he just simply didn't raise his hand. They went, dug a trench. The battle, if I'm talking about the Battle of Trenches here, he dug a trench. He, he sacrificed so much and they were so hungry at that time the Prophet Sallallahu had to tie mm. stones to his stomach. And the Sahabas did the same. And they sacrificed and they made dua. So they did a practical action and made dua. And we need to learn from that lessons. And the lesson is very simple, that you have to do everything. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Act and do whatever you are capable of doing. Then only then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will descend his nusra. And inshallah, Palestine will be free. I would like to end on this. They don't think that the Palestinians are the ones who are uns unsuccessful. Wallahi, they are, pray the kalama, they are in heaven. They have succeeded. The question is, are we going to be accepted? in the courts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and are we accepted to be the pioneers in trying to free the Palestinians? And that's the challenge we face. Indeed. Uh, Dr. Ismail Patel, Mona Ibrahim Musa, and Mona Ibrahim Baum, we thank you for your time and this uh, very special broadcast here on Radio Islam International.